Good morning. I'm Neil Petty. I'm here to help you out in our church service this morning. It's my understanding that we're having some internet issues, so people at home are not going to watch us live. They're going to be catching us afterwards, so you guys can edit any mistakes I make. So good morning and welcome to Allen Park Presbyterian Church. Whether you're in our sanctuary this morning or watching online, we hope you feel at home here. If you're watching online, comment in the chat so we can say hello. If you need more information, please visit our website, alumparkprez.org. Thank you, Neil. Good morning. So, um, technology, it's wonderful, right, when it works. And um, we've just had our first issue with our technology, and that is the fact that um, our internet provider isn't allowing us to send stuff up to it fast enough for us to do the video. So we're not going to be able to do that live today, and we have so many people that watch it. But we actually have three times as many that watch it afterwards. So um, so th this is... Um, this won't be lost. Uh, it'll probably, in about an hour after the surface, it'll be out there on Facebook and on YouTube. And if you're watching this later, we are so sorry about that, but it really is out of our control. Uh, we have to bring it up with WOW on Monday and figure out what we can do. I'm sure we'll get it fixed. As uh, I'm here today, I'm so happy to be with you because I just finished, Meg and I just finished up nine days of vacation and we were able to have all three of our boys together for a good portion of that, and that was just a blessing. Um, it makes you really uh, appreciate um, the finer things in life, which really is our friends, our family, our loved ones. And today, uh, you'll hear in our Gospel reading, we're going to talk about the Good Samaritan, which we've all heard that story. Uh, it's, it's one that we've heard from the very earliest days of our Sunday schools. And hopefully maybe we'll be able to take a little bigger bite on it today and maybe think about this. What is the definition of neighbor and who is our neighbor? So uh, before we get going, though, I also want to call some special attention to Nancy and Phil Atkinson. It's their 61st wedding anniversary. Congratulations. So we wanted to make sure that we got that, get, got that shout out to them very publicly. And they're wonderful people. As you're looking at this, uh, this table here for the communion, uh, Nancy, uh, well, we've got all sorts of people that work on things, but Nancy is such a big, big part of that. We thank you so much for that. So as we get prepared to worship today, I ask you, would you please pray with me? Holy God, you call us to live out your justice and righteousness as we gather here today, we ask your Holy Spirit to be here with us, to attend to us and to guide us, to help us, to help us walk in your footsteps so that we never lose our way. Enable us to live and love in the way that you have taught us so that we can act in grace, we can offer mercy, even to those who we consider our enemies. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And let us clear our hearts and minds for worship by listening to our prelude played by Christine El Hajj.
and it is a wonderful world. Please stand, if you're able, and join me in our call to worship. Love the Lord your God with all our heart and all our soul and with all our strength and with all our mind. Love your neighbor as yourself with our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all our mind. Do this and you will live. Let us worship God. Please remain standing as we sing our first hymn, number 305. Come sing, O Church in Joy. Claiming us in love, God beckons us to grow in that love and to reflect that love to others. Yet sin obstructs our efforts and prevents us from living as God intends. In penitence and faith, let us seek God's forgiveness. Would you please say the prayer of confession with me? Gracious God, Jesus tells us that our lives are enriched by loving you and by loving our neighbors. We confess that our love is hard for us. We are too selfish or too pessimistic, too hollow or too hardened, or just too tired to give ourselves to love's demands. Forgive us our arrogance and our listlessness. Cleanse our hearts that we might find the strength to do what love requires and the grace to receive what love has to give. We pray in the name of Jesus, who loves has no boundary. Now let us silently confess our sins. Amen. Friends, when we hear our gospel reading today, we'll hear the definition of neighbor and its linkage to mercy. We need to understand that mercy can be difficult for us because we only give it when we feel it's deserved. Yet from God, mercy flows unceasingly. 
and it flows directly from the heart of God. And friends, that is the good news of the day, that we have a God who created us, who loves us, forgives us, redeems us, and then pulls us into his own family. It is in the person and the work of Jesus Christ that we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. And now is our tradition here. I encourage you all to stand and turn to each other, both in person and online, and offer each other a sign of the peace of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you all, and also with you. Peace of Christ. Creator Christ and Holy Ghost. Amen. See, please be seated. And if we have any kids that want to come up for the children's time, I'd love to hear you come up. We got a few here. You know, we have a we have a lot of people up at Camp Wakanda this week. It's family camp. They started that Thursday or Thursday night and they're going to be, uh, they're coming home today. Shipmates goes up after that and then we've got two weeks in a row of, uh, of children's camp. So we pray that, uh, that all, the, I, I talked to somebody today, things are going well. They've had beautiful weather up there. So we hope that. Hey guys, how are you? Good? It's good to have you guys here today. Hey, I have a question. I always have a question, don't I? You probably say, Pastor Tim asked too many questions, and I do. So I wanted to talk to you about something. So do you know what a neighbor is? Yeah? What do you say a neighbor is? Can you help me out? Yeah, go ahead. Someone who lives next to you. I agree. That's definitely a neighbor. That's definitely a neighbor. Do you know your neighbors? Do you like your neighbors? No good. <laughs> That's always a hard question to ask. How about you? Do you know your neighbors? The, peop the people that live next to you? Yeah. So you know them by name, right? And you know that if a neighbor needed something, you would do it for them, right? So, like, we have a lot of neighbors, but, like, our neighbor sometimes, well, what's the matter? Oh, she's thirsty. Well, you've got to get her some water then. Would you like some water? That's very neighborly. That's right. Here, would you like that water? You're welcome. See? That's being a neighbor right there, unscripted and unplanned. So when somebody needs something and they're a neighbor, we say, well, you know, we have a relationship with them. We know them. Do you guys want water? I have some water here if you need some water here. Here. Get water for everybody. There you go. So on a hot day, it's that. But we know that our neighbors... Uh, when they get into problems. But sometimes we see people that need help that aren't our neighbors. What happens if we're driving down the road and we see somebody with a flat tire on the side of the road? Do we stop? Do we stop and help them? And the answer is no, we really don't. Sometimes we might, but most times we don't because we're like, we don't know that person. It's a busy street. Um, maybe it's a setup, all of these things, and we just say, or, or we say, I'm too busy, I got some place to go. So we, we don't even look at the people that need help. Well, Jesus wants us to know that our neighbors are everybody that we interact with. So if we see that person with a flat tire and we can help, we should help. 
And if we see somebody who is outside and they're crying, we should ask them, I'm sorry you're not feeling well. Is there anything that I could do to help? Because that person might be in a real bad problem. Okay? So remember, it's not just the people that we know and love, but it's the people that we don't know that we're supposed to help too. All right? So I had all that extra water here, and now I don't. So that's really good. But thank you so much for coming up. Let's have a word of prayer before we go. Lord, we thank you for these little ones. They are just so blessed. We thank you for giving them to us so that we might walk with them and help in their faith formation. And Lord, we thank you for the lessons that you give us in Holy Scripture, especially about the Good Samaritan and what it means to be a neighbor and to help one another. We ask that you just put that heart of the Holy Spirit into these children. And Lord, let us not stand in the way of that. We ask all of this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, thanks. Thank you. If you don't want the water, you don't have to drink it. Bye-bye. It's a tough act to follow. Holy God, this is the time when we quiet our hearts and our minds to pay attention, to really pay attention to what you have to say to us today. Fill us with your word and give us understanding by your Holy Spirit that having heard your word, we may live lives worthy of you and please you in every way. Amen. A reading from Psalm 82. Listen for God's word for us today. God has taken his place in the divine council, in the midst of the gods he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk around in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I say, you are gods, children of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Rise up, O God, judge the earth for all the nations belong to you. Thank you, Neil. Just a comment on Psalm 82 before we go on with our gospel reading. The Hebrew scriptures indicate that uh, there was a general acknowledgement that, um, that the heavens, the heavenly, wasn't just limited to God, that there was other gods, small g, and um, that there was this interplay between these. And the thing I love about Psalm 82 is how these other gods, well, they're underneath God. And God isn't beyond calling them out, saying, look how you're treating people. That's not right. These people that you're mistreating are walking around and not knowing what true mercy is. And you, these other heavenly beings, I am committing that you will die like mortals so that you can feel the same evil that you have put on to, these other pe to, to the people of the earth. We have a choice to make each and every day. That choice is what are we gonna do? Who are we gonna affiliate with? Who are we gonna like? How are we gonna treat people? And we really should be thinking about when we get up every morning our basis for how we interact with others. I want to continue on with our gospel reading, and this is out of Luke's gospel. It's chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. 
And um, the context of this is this is another test of Jesus, but not just a test, but also um, I think a legitimate question from somebody who has a belief in the supreme God. And he's an attorney, a lawyer, which means that he knew, he knew the law of Moses as it was handed down in what we call the Old Testament. That would be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's the Pentateuch. He probably knew it like the back of his hand. So let's listen now for the word of the Lord. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he, Jesus, said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? The lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road and when he saw this person he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed him by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them, and then he put him on his own animal. He brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, the Samaritan took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you, you may have to spend. Now Jesus asked the question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. There's every once in a while, I look back on my days in seminary and go, yeah, I'm really glad I did that. This is one of them. Because the immediately as I'm like this, what's all this talk about neighbor? And just like I said with the kids, we all know who our neighbors are right? We pretty much pick our neighbors because we could have people living right next to us and if we have bad interactions with them, we don't even consider them to be a neighbor anymore, right? We just kind of cut them right out of our life. Now, most of us get along with our neighbors. Oh, there's going to be little mix-ups, right? Um, we live in Dearborn now. We've never lived closer to people than we have right now. If, if my neighbor is watching her TV, I know what station she's watching, because I can not only hear it, but I can see it too. Only about eight foot between the houses. But there's fences, thank goodness. We've been there about two and a half years, and I can honestly say that we have gotten to know most of our neighbors. Not all, there's a couple that are just very standoffish. And even though we've extended the hand and saying, hi, how are you? I'm Tim, this is Meg. Some of them just don't seem to respond. Some of them, I hope they're not watching this today. Some of them seem to take friendship a little too far. Oh. The one time when their lawnmower was broken that I cut their lawn, all of a sudden it's like, could you cut my lawn again? No. <laughs> but that same neighbor lives alone, had a cancer scare, had nobody to take her to the hospital to get treatment. 
we were like, why did you even wonder whether you could ask? Of course we're going to do that for you. We have neighbors up at our cottage, and my uncle and I, who is watching this probably, had to buy a new dock. And we had to go out pretty far to get deep enough and then the water came up and we didn't need all that dock and it was just sitting there. And one of my neighbors comes up and says, I'd like to rent some of your dock so I could use it if you're not using it. And I said, just take it, just use it. Well, no, I'm, I want to pay you. No, use it. It's just sitting there. You using it isn't going to damage it. Just take it. Well, I don't understand why you wouldn't want it, because this is what neighbors do for one another. We just watch out and take care of it. So we can all agree that the people that live around us are neighbors. But we're also neighborly with a lot of other people. We have a lot of friends that we treat just the same as the neighbors that we like. The reason I bring this up is because Jesus, in answering this attorney's question, so well comes to him and says, okay, what do you have to do to inherit eternal life? And he says, okay, you tell me, what's written in the law? And he repeats to him the beginning of the Shema. This is out of Deuteronomy 6. Now, the Shema means here, and it begins. This is the prayer that opens all Jewish worship. It's the call to temple. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you're at home and when you are away and when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is how important it is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your might and strength. It is the requirement that God puts forward to us of loyalty. The man knew that. He repeated it. And then he throws in, oh, and um, your neighbor. Got to love your neighbor. Well, that comes from Leviticus 19, where it just says to treat your neighbor as yourself. Jesus, in another gospel account, says that this is the greatest bifold commandment, to love the Lord your God and to, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So in this one, we hear about the attorney, and the attorney goes, well, yeah, that's good. Jesus says, do that, and you will have eternal life. Now, it could have just been done right there. But the attorney then raises the stakes. Who is my neighbor? And as he is like to do, Jesus answers that question, with the parable. Now, remember, I always tell people, the greatest way to, to mine the most out of any parable, kind of go through it multiple times. Put yourself in a position of each person that's mentioned in that parable and think about it. How, how would I react in that situation? How am I like this person? How am I not like this person? And remember, every single person is a par in a parable is important. I hesitate to say this, but there really isn't any central character in most of the parables. It's about all of them together. So he tells this story about a man, a Jewish man, going from 
Jerusalem to Jericho. Jericho is to the north east of Jerusalem and it's along the Jordan River but it's also lower because we know the Dead Sea is the lowest point, right? So you actually in about, mm, I don't know, maybe 30 miles, you go, you, you drop a thousand feet. And in order to do that, the road, you can't have a hill. <laughs> That's too steep. So it's all these switchbacks going back and forth. Martin Luther King Jr. On the evening before he was assassinated, April 3rd, 1968, he gave his I Have a Dream speech. He gave it in multiple locations. He, he, also, gave it, um, he also gave it that night before. But he added how he and his wife, Loretta Scott King, had been to Jerusalem, had rented a car, and had made that drive from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he said, Jesus couldn't have put it in a more desolate, unforgiving, and scary place with all of these switchbacks. It was also called the way of blood because it was known that there was a number of bandits that could, that could attack. So the fact that the man is attacked isn't the biggest part of the story. It's what happens after that. And the first character after the man to enter into this parable is a priest. A priest. The person who represents God's grace and mercy on the earth. And as he comes by, he sees this just lump of a man bleeding, maybe dead, maybe not. And what does he do? He doesn't offer aid. He goes as far as he can to the other side and passes by. And then like him, a Levite. These are the people who are uh, part, of the, the, uh, part of the tribe who assisted within the temple. Another holy person. Another person who should be best able to demonstrate God's love and mercy for other people. And he also passes by on the other side. Now there's some, there's some people who say that they had no choice because if they had touched a dead body, that they would be defiled and they couldn't have continued on uh, without cleansing themselves. I don't think that was the case because they were going from Jerusalem to Jericho. So I don't think that that was too much of an issue. What it was is that they were just like, it's, I don't know them and I'm more important. And I'm just going to pass them by. The third person comes in. The Samaritan, yay! The hero. Do you know that Jewish people and Samaritan people absolutely hated each other at the time that this was told? They had a divergent theology. They both believed in it, but the Samaritans worshipped their own way on their own mountain. In fact, there had been a tremendous problem because this, some Samaritans had brought in some bones and defiled the temple in Jerusalem about this same time. So, a lot of friction between these two groups. And this Samaritan doesn't even look to see, is this man Jewish? Is he Samaritan? He just says, I'm going to help. And it's not just saying, are you okay? He makes sure he's alive. He cleanses and bandages his wounds. He puts him on his own animal and then walks that animal to an inn and then tells the innkeeper, take care of this person. Here's enough money to pay for the next several days. And if it takes you more money, do it and I will pay you on my way back. So Jesus looks and says, who is the neighbor? And the lawyer, who before this probably would have said, oh, my Jewish brothers and sisters, says the one who showed him mercy. In the scripture, in Leviticus, the Hebrew word is called re. And it means a close acquaintance. 
somebody that you have multiple points of interaction with. But when we go to this gospel account and we look here, it's peleos, that's the Greek word, and it has mm, a geographical aspect to it. It means the people who are you are near physically. Jesus, I'm sure knowingly, picks this word to say as a hint, right? Your neighbor is more than just the people that are like you. In fact, it's the people who you probably distrust and perhaps even hate the most. It's not that we have to like them. It's not that we have to spend a lot of time together. Maybe that's an impossibility, but we have to be able to show mercy and grace when that opportunity presents itself. And it really is an opportunity. The use of these two words and these intersections of Leviticus and what we read in Luke here creates a tension. What does he mean? Are we supposed to go back to this and take a very narrow definition of neighbor? Or are we supposed to expand it and say, boy, I really need to look at what I consider a neighbor and how I treat other people. I don't know if I'm ever gonna know all of my neighbors. Every time we move, we have to find new ones. But what Jesus is telling me is that I need to consider everyone that I interact with as a neighbor. And that creates a problem. Because if you know me, I'll be late to everything trying to help people. I'm the guy that used to, just because I forgot to put it back in is the only reason I don't have it right now, I used to carry one of those battery um, jumper boxes in my car because it's like if somebody's battery, I want to be right there to help. I can do that because I could do it. I knew how to get the hood up and I knew how to hook up the, the cables. I mean, I can't fix an engine that doesn't start. I have no idea about that, but I can fix a battery. I used to call, I called it my battery ministry. There it was. I'd be at the... I'd be at the store, oh, that car's trying to start. I'm going to be there. And then, of course, when I got there, just as I'm getting there, saying, look, I got this. The, the lady's car started, and she looked at me with these wide eyes, and like, oh, i got to get out of here. <laughs> Crazy guy coming after me. We all have gifts. That was my point of telling that story. And we all have blessings, and a blessing is a gift that we're given <clears throat> in greater abundance excuse me, <clears throat> in greater abundance than we can ever consume ourselves or for our own purposes. It means we have an overage and we're not to sit on it, we're to use it. And some of our gifts are healing, compassion, mercy, helping. We belong to a church. And as I'm looking at all the faces here, because I've seen it at work, if one of us hurts, we all hurt. We're all here for one another. And that's a trust and a feeling that, that it's wonderful. But I think that our scripture today wants us to pull out of that, not to lose that, to keep that, but to understand that between all of us, we have so much more mercy to give that we can go out and be the light of Christ and we can spread that into this community. How wide is your circle of neighbors? Is there a chance that you'll come from hearing this today and think about that? 
and realize that God gives us these gifts so that we can help others. But by doing that, that person that we help, that person that we might just call a neighbor, do you know that they can end up as close friends? And they can be more, they can be more different than us, than similar, and we can love them. I didn't mention this, but the neighbors on either side of us in Dearborn are Muslim. We get along great. I can't have them over for barbecue ribs. But, well, we can do beef ribs, but not the really good pork ribs. But we can be friends. We can help each other. When one of us is out of, the, out of town, we watch the other, people, other one's house. And through the course of two and a half years, from these neighbors who I didn't even understand what they were saying sometimes, I've come to realize that it's an awfully big world and that it's a lot more than just the people that think and look and act and laugh like me. You have this opportunity. I hope you use it. Be blessed. And our hymn today will be number 203. It's a wonderful hymn. And um, it was actually written in Spanish originally. We'll sing the English version for everybody. It's Jesu, Jesu, fill us with your love. You'll please stand and join us in singing. We didn't mention this as you were coming in, but you should have um, been offered at least um, just a communion cup and wafer, and uh, they should, you should have those. If you don't have one and would like one, raise your hand and the ushers will bring one to you. We need one up front here. All right, it's on its way. So um, right up here in front. And if you're online with us, I hope that you've prepared some elements so that you can share with this together. You know, when this pandemic started, the one thing that we, the big question that we had was, could we do an online communion? 
or was there a requirement that we have the common cup and the, and the bread? And, um, and actually, our denomination, the PCUSA, um, the original uh, thing that they told us was, no, you can't. You know, that's something, we're not going to do that. Well, many of us just went ahead and did it anyway. And um, so it's pesky Presbyterians. We don't, we don't take no for an answer very well. So, but we've continued to do this, and we, we await on the time when we can have everybody come forward and serve out of a common cup. Um, we pray that that's happening sooner rather than later. Look at all this wonderful bread that we have here. And this bread is available. So if you would like some after the service, if you come forward, they'll, pack it, they'll package it up and you can bring it home with you. And uh, there's so much and that would be a waste if we didn't do such a thing. So what we use for our communion here is a piece of unleavened bread. This would have been the Passover bread that uh, Jesus used when he performed the first Holy Communion. There wasn't time for the bread to rise. So to commemorate that, they do use unleavened bread and that's what we try to use here uh, in, our, in our communion too. The reason why I wanted to tell you about all the food that's on this table is because it's too much. We, there's just, we couldn't all consume what's here for the purposes of this communion. So we need to share it. It's the blessing that we need to share. And each and every day, each of us as individuals and as a group are going to be giving more blessing in an abundance that we can't use. So our job is to figure that out with some divine guidance and prayer and then to go out and to use it into the world. In my life before I was a minister, I worked in industry and, um, you know, industry can be pretty tough sometimes. And um, we had a major customer that walked in and um, we had a close relationship and, but they called and they said, we really need to come up and see you on Thursday. And we said, well, I said, just tell me over the phone. No, no, we need to come see you in person. Well, what it was is that they were pulling all of their business from us. Several million dollars worth of business. Not because we'd done anything wrong, but because they wanted to get a bigger and longer contract with the government and their major competitor said, well, we won't bid on that if you give us all the molding work that Ames Rubber is doing now. Pretty nasty. And as angry as I was, and as upset as I was, we had scheduled to go to lunch with these folks. And so as we finished up, I said, well, okay, well, this has not been the day that I expected, but let's go to lunch. And the general manager of, of that company looked at me and said, are you sure? After what we just said, and I said, you know, you've paid an awful lot of our bills with your business over the, over the couple, uh, past couple years. And I have a feeling that this might work out for the better at some point. And we're friends and we should go eat around a common table and we did that. Now, two years later, that same guy called me up and says, I got four million dollars of business that I want to put with you. And we're not going to take it away this time. And then he said, and Tim, the way that you treated us after we delivered that terrible news, when we were driving back to, to our house, we said, we need to continue to do business with Ames Rubber Corporation. There's magic around the table. There's mystery around the table. And I, Jesus invites you to the table to participate where wonderful things and miracles can happen. We come here because Jesus tells us to come here. On the night that he was betrayed, he gathered all of his disciples with him in that upper room. And as they went through the entire liturgy of the Passover supper, which they all knew so well, Jesus changed it. And after giving a blessing and offering thanks, 
He took the bread and he broke it. And looking at his disciples, he said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in a similar manner after the supper, he took the cup. He took the cup and he proclaimed that this cup is the new covenant the contract between God and his people. He said it was his blood shed for the forgiveness of sins and that whenever we take the cup and eat the bread, we proclaim the saving death of Jesus Christ until he comes again. We gather around this table, not with just the people in this room, but with the believers of all time who have ever, who, who, who uh, at any time have recreated this Last Supper, and made it into a holy moment, we invite the tremendous cloud of witnesses, all the people who have preceded us, and the people who come after us, who proclaim our faith in salvation through Jesus Christ by taking the bread and drinking the cup. Friends, I encourage you to take the wafer. The body of Christ broken for us. in the cup of salvation. Friends, let us pray. All-knowing and loving God, you can discern our thoughts and you are acquainted with all of our ways. Before a word is on our lips, you know it all together. You lay your hand upon us as Christ calls us to ministry. You fill us with your Holy Spirit who heals us and leads us by your wisdom and counsel. You guide us throughout our lives and our journey. You forgive our waywardness. You equip us to serve you and you give us every provenance that we might need to fulfill what you require. Nothing we can do escapes your eye. There is nowhere we can hide from you. You are within and without, before us and beyond us, over us, under us, alongside of us. O God of our being, we give you a praise and thanksgiving. We pray that you will hasten the day when our love for you matches your mercy towards us. Enlarge our hearts to the dimensions of your mercy and help us to return to you a measure of the love that you give so freely to us. Purify our souls with your continuing assurance of pardon and save us from our love of idols and vain displays. Strengthen us whereby we may serve you more effectively and we may glorify your name through our obedience to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray for all who are uh, in need of medical uh, healing. We pray for guidance for their doctors. We pray for those who have faced the loss of loved ones, who know the depths of grief. Lord, put into us the hope that regardless of what happens to us on this earth, that we have an eternity that we will spend not only with you, but the people that we love also. Give us the mind of Christ as we look upon our neighbor. Let us widen our definition of neighbor to be not just the people that are like us or live directly next to us, but the people that are different from us, who maybe we might just interact with momentarily. Keep us from passing by those whom society has overlooked. Plant indebitably on our hearts the plight of the homeless, the forsaken and the poor, the sick. 
Lend us a portion of your grace as we seek to lift them from their despair. Let them know that the world is not evil, but the world is in the process of becoming more like the ideal of the kingdom that will come soon. We pray all of this as we seek the gentle embrace of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who came that all may have life and to have that life abundantly. And let us pray as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen, friends. Thank you so much for being with us to honor and to glorify and to praise God and to give awareness and thanks for all of the gifts that have been showered down upon us. As we leave this place, we pray Godspeed for safe travels for all of our returning campers from Wakanda and those who will be going up, not only this week, but in the coming weeks. And we do pray for all who are in need of prayer. Um, our internet issue, we hope we're gonna get it resolved, but we know our phones aren't working really great at the church. So uh, if you need something, call my cell phone. We'll make sure that it gets going on all that. But again, thank you so much for being here. And uh, God bless you all. And as we leave, we know that we don't go into this world alone, thank God, but that we go with the love of God, the peace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Be blessed.